Alright, ladies and gentlemen, this class recording has started. So, yesterday, we began our discussion of covalent bonding. And, hold on a second, just this. We began our discussion of covalent bonding. And the first thing we talked about was that covalent bonding is similar in many ways to ionic bonding. What is one way that ionic bonding and covalent bonding are similar to one another? Well, hold on a second. Now you're good. Okay, it holds atoms together. Attractive forces that holds atoms together. What else? What are other ways that ionic bonding and covalent bonding are similar? You could look at the beginning of your outline from yesterday. That might help. Well, there, ha there has to be some kind of positive or negative attraction to hold the atoms together. What else? Alex, good. They deal with valence electrons. Brooke, what else? It involves, it involves energy, especially what? What are these atoms trying to do? Get to a, le a lower energy state, okay? And they do that by what? Mindy, what were you going to say? Go ahead. You don't, you don't have to think. Okay. What else? How do, these, how do these atoms achieve that low energy state? Picking up valence electrons to get to what? Eight, right? That's still the magic number, okay? But the one thing that, or not one thing, there's a couple things, but ionic bonding and covalent bonding are different. How? Um, ionic bonding, one gives away and one picks up. Okay. And one, and one, and one, and one. Right. So ionic bonding involves a transfer of electrons from one atom to another to create positive cations and negative anions, mm -hmm. where Covalent bonding, we're sharing those electrons between two atoms, and the attraction between the nucleus and those electrons is what holds them together. Okay. Good? Okay. So, yesterday we introduced covalent bond. What is a covalent bond? Let's start with that. What is a covalent bond? How many valence electrons are they sharing? One pair of shared electrons is called a single covalent bond. So, Angel, how many are they sharing? Two, right? Pairs two. <laughs> All right, so a pair of shared electrons is a covalent bond. Yesterday, and I apologize, I didn't write this up on the board yesterday. Um, yesterday, I showed you, I got to find my magic pen. There it is. All right? So yesterday, we talked about this chlorine with its seven valence electrons, and this chlorine with its seven valence electrons, right? And they share this pair, it's all good, right? Yeah. So we represent this in a couple of different ways. The most common way we represent it is by taking this pair of shared electrons and replacing it with a straight line that connects the two atoms together. So this represents two chlorine atoms covalently bonded together where the straight line is representing the pair of shared electrons. We call this a structural formula, which, is, which shows up um, at the bottom of your outline on the first page. Okay. So the structural formula shows these two atoms bonded together with a straight line to represent the pair of electrons that they are sharing. Good there? Next term that we threw out there yesterday was a molecule. A molecule is an electronically neutral group of atoms held together by covalent bonds. Another thing that makes ionic bonding different from covalent bonding is the type of elements that ionically bond versus the type of elements that covalently bond. What kind of elements ionically bond with each other? Metals and nonmetals. But covalent bonding is between nonmetals and nonmetals. So molecules an electronically neutral group of atoms held together by one or more covalent bonds should always have nonmetals in them because 
That's how we covalently bond. Okay? Yesterday, we talked about a specific type of molecule called a diatomic molecule. A diatomic molecule is a, a molecule that has two of the same type of atoms. We saw that there were seven elements on the periodic table that will form diatomic molecules. <coughs> let's, let's, not re, let's, not, let's not rehash that. All right, so. um, what was I going to say? Oh, as far as the elements that form diatomic molecules, first, your four halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and then hydrogen as well. But then the last two, oxygen and nitrogen, we used as examples of elements or atoms that will form multiple bonds, right? That in certain circumstances, atoms will not only share one pair of electrons, but they can share up to, or they can share two pairs of electrons or up to three pairs of electrons. Okay? So multiple bonds are when atoms are held together by sharing more than one pair of electrons. A double bond is two pairs of electrons or four total. A triple bond is three pairs of electrons or six total. Good there? We need a couple seconds to finish writing that down. I know that was right at the end of the period yesterday, so. Good? All right, so as far as representing those, right? If we have oxygen being held together by a double bond, how many lines are there in between it? Two, because each line represents a pair of shared electrons. And then it would have these extra electrons that aren't being shared by anything, okay? And then at the end of the period yesterday, we talked about nitrogen, and nitrogen is held together by how many covalent bonds? Three, a triple bond, right? So there are three lines in between it, and then the two electrons that aren't being shared on each atom, right? These are all structural formulas showing how the atoms are connected together and how many electrons they're sharing, shorthand version. Okay? Good there. All right. I'm going to ask you to do something today that I don't ask you to do very often. I'm going to ask you to actually write down some notes without filling in an outline. Wow. I know. Okay. Well, I give you homework three, four nights a week. It's, it's there for you. So, yeah. Maybe instead of, you know, complaining about test grades, maybe we could do a little more homework. I mean, that might help, you know. You're not the one who's complaining about the test grades. Just saying. So, yeah. So, anyway. All right. So let's go here. Now, a couple options. One, the, the back of the outline I gave you yesterday is blank, but the sheet that I gave to you today, the single sheet, is blank on the back side, and it just so happens that these notes relate to what's on the other side. So it might be a good idea to write these things down on the back of that sheet I gave you today, and then we'll do some practice on the front, okay? All right, so today, we are going to talk about writing chemical formulas like we did before, names and formulas again, but this time, we're gonna do covalent compounds instead of ionic compounds. Before we get too deep into this, Okay. Let's talk about taking notes. Okay. Taking notes does not necessarily mean you write down every single thing that goes up on the board. Okay. That's one of the reasons why I don't just give you guys notes like this too often, because it gets really boring, because you guys do just write down every single thing that's up here, and I have to wait for you to write it down, and it's just boring. So, okay. But anyway, let's talk about writing down the important <laughs> stuff. So we're going to start with our discussion about chemical formulas. So let's talk about a chemical formula. Uh, let me get this first. Okay, here. Let's talk about. Nope, there. Come on. All right, let's talk about 
this chemical formula, one that you're probably familiar with. Okay? Yes? I've heard of that one before? Okay. All right. That chemical formula can tell us two things about that compound. What can that chemical formula tell us about that compound? There's two oxygens and one carbon. So it has told us both the kind of atom and also, what else? How many of them there are, right? So again, don't just start blindly writing, okay? Chemical formulas are a shorthand way of describing atoms that make up a molecule, right? Chemical formulas show us two things, the kind of atom and how many of each type there are, all right? So really, what's the important part of that slide? Right, the last part, right? That's really the important part, okay? This is true of formulas for ionic compounds or formulas for covalent compounds. Both of them do this. They both will tell you what kind of elements there are and how many of each kind of element there are. So we got enough written down here? No. Don't write it all. Right? Short abbreviation. All right. Ready? <coughs> okay. Today, specifically, we want to talk about naming covalent compounds. So. First, if they are covalent compounds, that means they're going to have what kind of elements in them? Nonmetals non and nonmetals, okay? Similarly to naming ionic compounds, the name of a covalent compound is based on the name of the two elements. So there are some similarities. And by convention, we always write the name of the most metallic element written first. Where are metals on the periodic table? Left hand side, right? So that means that elements farthest to the left get written first when we write the name. That may then lead us to the next logical question. Anybody got a question that comes out of that? What if they're in the same column, right? What if they're in the same family? When that's the case, we write the one that's farther down first, okay? So naming covalent compound, the most metallic one comes first. That's the one farthest to the left. If they're both in the same family, the one that's lower comes first. Yeah, go ahead. Closer to the bottom, yeah. So technically it would be, you need know, to technically be the one with the higher atomic number because that's lower down on the periodic table. Next thing I want you to write down, even though it's not gonna show up here, okay, because I forgot to include it on the slide. The second word we change the ending to IDE just like we do with ionic compounds. So the first word is going to be the name of the most metallic element. The second word is going to be similar to the name of the most the non-metallic non element, the second element, but we do change the ending to IDE. So you might want to include that even though it's not written up here. Yep. You just stretching. That doesn't sound pleasant at all. Yeah. <laughs> all right, good there. Those are how the names of, co of covalent and ionic compounds are similar 
but there are some differences, and here's why. What we will use is a set of prefixes to indicate the number of each kind of atom in that formula, or to describe the number of each kind of atom that shows up in that formula. This is different, and we'll talk about why here in just a second. Okay. So we have to include some prefixes to describe the number of each kind of atom in the formula. Good? Anybody else good? Kelly's good. Anybody else? Or I'm good. Good? So those prefixes are as follows. Okay? Might be a good idea to write these down because I'm going to use them soon. So. Some of them are probably uh, familiar to you. Some of them maybe not. Pick that one up. <laughs> you might be you might be a little bit deliberate. <laughs> All right, do we got these written down? Anybody need a couple more seconds? Take a look at. Let me go here, here, here. All right, the sheet that I gave you today. We're actually going to start down on the bottom right, looking at number 16 and number 18. Let's take a look at number 16 and number 18. All right. Two covalent compounds. How do I know that these compounds are held together with covalent bonds? They're both nonmetals. But as we see here, what are we seeing about the type of nonmetals that we have in these compounds? Chlorine and oxygen for both of them. But the ratio is different. So we need to have a way to distinguish between the top compound and the bottom compound. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So we said that the first word of the name of this compound is the name of the element that comes first. And I know that this actually goes against the rules that I said, but there are some exceptions. Technically chlorine is more to the right and oxygen is still to the left, but oxygen is really non-metallic. So you just kind of have to roll with these rules. Oxygen comes last, it just does, so. So, yeah, sorry, sorry, chlorine, like, you know, so. All right, uh, anyway, we said that the name of the first element comes first, okay, but what are we seeing about the number of chlorine atoms that are in this compound? Yeah. Two, so you go on to your sheet, and you find that the prefix that we die. use for two is? Di. And so the first word of this compound, or the name of this compound, is dichlorine. And then you find that the, there are seven oxygens. You go to your list and you say the prefix for seven is? Okay. So, okay. Well, let's talk about that. Whoa. Okay. So, if you were to write this, I'd give you full credit for it. If you were to write this, I would give you full credit for it. Okay. However, uh, if we use, and this is going to be a little confusing, okay, but you'll see why in a little bit. Okay. If we use a prefix that has two syllables in front of oxygen, we end up with two vowels right, in, right next to each other, right? So 
we get rid of the vowel on the prefix, and this just becomes heptoxide. It, like I said, if you were to write, if you were to write uh, um, heptaoxide, I'd give you credit for that. Be fine. Uh, here. So we start off, right? Dichlorine again. Okay. And then you look on your chart and you find that the prefix that we use for one of something is mono. mono. Okay. So again, two things. One, if you wrote monoxide, I would give you credit for that. But again, we have a two-syllable prefix, so we drop that extra. And we drop that extra O because if you didn't, it would be monoxide, and that just sounds funny. Okay? Because that's what double O makes, right? Mm. Right? Manuke side. And that's just sounds weird. Wait, then what's, how does, like, how does it, like, what's that? Like, how does it okay, so let's talk about the next one, all right? So, next example I want to do with you is number 11. All right, so number 11 is this formula right here, okay? So first, we start off and we find out that the first element here is phosphorus, but how many phosphoruses are there? One. So, we should go monophosphorus. However, if, if there is only one of the first elements, you don't write the mono. Okay. So, this is just phosphorus. Okay? Yes, bro. Only for mono. Okay, because like on the last ones, right, here, both of these were dichlorine because they were two. That, only, that rule only applies if it's mono. Okay? So, we go phosphorus, and then, right, how many chlorines are there? Five, so you find the prefix, right? Pentachloride. We keep the A in there because, right? It's not a double vowel. All right, are we good here? Good with those examples? All right, have at it, everybody. Finish the rest of this, okay? You can work with the person next to you, okay? I'll put answers up on the board here in just a second. Oh yeah, you do. Do you do the top too? Say again. Do I do the top part? Um, yeah, do the top part as well. Gentlemen, uh, answers are up on the board. Here's the first half. I'll show you the second half in a second if you want to check them out. I am positive I don't want to bike anywhere. I heard. I heard. All right, so are we looking for the bottom now? Wait. Not yet. And here's the bottom.
If only you had, if only you had a box that would tell you all the answers to all your questions. Like, you know. So. All right. How are we here? All right. So. Hey. One last thing that I want to uh, conclude class with. Okay. So. Uh, do you guys recall about a week ago that I don't know that song. So. Keep going, keep going. Hopefully, uh, you remember. How's that? Is that better? So, hopefully, you remember. About a week ago, I uh, told you guys about an article that I read about how scientists were made, uh, how stupid American people were. Okay. So, and I said that reading that article gave me an answer to a question that's a difficult question for teachers sometimes, and that question is, why do I have to know this stuff? And I said that the answer to that question for me now is so that you don't appear stupid out there in the real world, and then by association make me look stupid as well. Okay. Because when presented with these facts about dihydrogen monoxide, uh, these two researchers, and I don't know if they're real or not, but found that 90% of citizens participating in their study were willing to sign a petition to support an outright ban on the use of dihydrogen monoxide in the United States. So, because, I mean, after all, it could kill you if you inhale it. We have a name for that. It's called drowning. Uh, prolonged exposure to solid DHMO causes severe tissue damage. That's frostbite. Uh, excessive ingestion produces a number of unpleasant, though not typically life-threatening, side effects. You have to pee. Right. Uh, it's a major component of acid rain. Yes. <laughs> it's the rain part. Uh, it contributes to soil erosion. Yes. Beach erosion as well. Right. Uh, what else? Uh, it decreases the effectiveness of automobile brakes. Yes. It's given to vicious dogs involved in recent deadly attacks. Yes. So, because dogs drink water, whether they've attacked people or not, right? So, so I, I said, by the way, are we all good? That dihydrogen monoxide is actually just H2O, right? Okay. All right, everybody. Hey, I won't be here on Monday. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Bye.